Good morning. Welcome to this morning's meeting of the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee. Can I introduce the top table, please? Councillor Liz Barrett on my left, your, your right hand side is the Vice Convener, Barbara Renton, who's the Chief Executive Director of Communities and Annie Williams from Committee Services. I will now ask Danny to confirm any apologies received and take a roll call of the members in attendance. Yes, thank you, convener. Morning, everyone. Um, we've got a full house today, convener. So uh, I'll run through who's in the chambers uh, first of all. I think we've got one. Um, we've got one member online, so we'll confirm that in a second. But we've got councillors Anderson, Barrett, Cuthbert, Forbes, Illinworth, Kigali, Lang, McEwen, Stewart, and yourself, convener. All join us in the chambers. Um, and councillor Welsh, you're online, please. Yes, good morning. Yeah, morning. Thank you very much. So that's everyone here convener. And as I say, uh, there's no apologies today. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, just remind councillors and officers joining us virtually to use the chat box to attract my attention. Those present in the chamber, can you just raise your hand, please? Can I ask if there are any declarations of interest in respect of business on the agenda today? I assume there's no declarations of interest. Thank you for that. Uh, approval of minutes. Can we agree the minute for our meeting held on the 16th of November 2022? Thank you. Can we agree the minute from our special meeting held on 19th of December 2022? Thank you. Our first item is, is a motion brought before us by uh, Councillor Kugali and Councillor Forbes. Uh, in in um, preparation or just an intro to this uh, uh, motion, uh, within the scheme of administration, um, the conservation area planning clearly sits within EI and ED committee, um, where this committee can uh, look at various issues in relation to climate change, to buildings and energy. Uh, um, the, the, I, I would like if any comments made, any are kept within that and do not stray into what is the, the remit of the EI and ED committee, committee. If I can ask Councillor Kugali if you would like to move your motion. I assume it's going to go up on screen as well. Oh, terrific. This is an incredibly, incredibly important signal as to the broad intent of, of Perth and Ross Council to prioritise the ability of residents in Perth and Ross to play the role that they want to in terms of pre preserving the climate and making their own homes more sustainable. I know we've all seen the news stories and probably heard from so many frustrated residents over the past few months who have been frustrated and slightly confused by the fact that you know cur current conservation area rules and sometimes their homes being in conservation areas when they haven't really realised have limited the, their ability to make their homes more sustainable. And it's important that we use the voice of this committee, given it's the Climate and Sustainability Committee, to highlight those issues. And I hope that this is a moment where we can encourage and empower residents to make their home more sustainable moving forward. Whilst it's frustrating we can't solve this issue overnight, I am hopeful that the combination of, of this and uh, calling on the Scottish Government to play their role and review what is permitted development within conservation areas, that we can begin to really make meaningful change here and empower residents of Perth and Kinross that I know have been incredibly frustrated. Too often our, our conservation areas and planning laws are incredibly archaic and restrictive in terms of you know, empowering people to prioritise the the things that we tell them that we should be. And this is an opportunity to really start making that change. Um, and I hope it's you know, relatively non-controversial um, because it, you know, it's common sense policy. Um, and I hope that we can move this and we'll, we'll come together on this today. Thank you. Councillor Forbes, would you like to second? Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, 
I think as we as we move into the world where climate change is more important to us than it ever has been, I think we'll recognise that the rules we made many, many years ago are, are now out of date and well past their sell by date. And we'll see more areas of conflict. And for example, the area that we've highlighted over um, solar panels on roofs of buildings within conservation areas is, is just one example of that. And as Councillor Kigali said, that this is a, should be a non-controversial thing. These rules were written a very long time ago. I think they are well past their sell by date. And it's great that we're able to review them. And I hope we'll get broad support for this uh, from across the chamber. And I'm happy to second. Thank you. Can, can I uh, just open this up to any comments um, or if any individuals need a points of clarification from officers? Councillor Lee. How many? I was just wondering. Uh, is, this, is this a point of clarification or a It's a, a question. It, it'll, be either points of, it'll be either a point of clarification. OK, it's a point of clarification. How many uh, planning applications have been refused um, in the last year, say, for um, people wishing to make uh, improvements in a, within a conservation area, improvements related to improving the insulation or improving the the heat, the viability of, of keeping themselves warm within the homes? And how many have been refused on when that's what the application has been uh, to, rather than just a general application about putting an extension on the front of a, a, a house? Thank you. I believe David Littlejohn is on the call. Are you able to answer this? I am, yes. Um, in, in the year kind of 22-23, so the current operating year that we're just ending, there were 71 applications in conservation areas that involved either an element of window replacement, door replacement or, or solar panels. And of those 71 applications to date, seven of those have been refused planning permission. Thanks. Councillor Jack Welch, you have a comment to make? Uh, yes, thanks, uh, convener. I, I understand the, the general sentiment of this motion, but um, I, I, I think um, there is sensitivity in this area. Um, this is a fast uh, changing um, uh, piece with energy efficiency and, and, and mitigations of, of climate. And indeed, you know, window replacement, door replacement, uh, solar PV panels and external wall insulation are all good mitigating measures to reduce uh, energy use within properties. However, it, you know, it, it is fair to point out that, that, that there is in cases where buildings have significant architectural merit and value either in place or or location um that, that those considerations are taken into uh, place uh, you know as well um I, I, for example, it would be it would be I think a, a significant impact. For example, on the external facade of the Houses of Parliament, if the Houses of Parliament roofs were clad in solar PV panels uh, or, or external external wall insulation. But there are significant uh, measures that can be taken that that, that uh, do maintain uh, those conservation um, area uh, elements, and um, certainly you know these these should obviously be considered uh, as well. Thank you. Councillor uh, Tom McCune, you have a point, point of clarification. Yes, and listen to Councillor Kugali introduce his motion. He talked about highlighting the issues and hope we could all agree on them and empowering residents. Uh, in both these statements, he didn't highlight any issues. Uh, and what does he actually mean by empowering residents? Because I know there is an attitude out there might be a minority attitude that some people feel that if they own something they can do with it as they wish rather than being a custodian of something that is of huge importance to the wider community so before I agree with the motion I'd like to know what they mean by these things. Councillor Kigali do you want to comment on that? 
Yes, uh, what I think is really important to highlight here, and it kind of goes to what Councillor Welch was saying as well, is that there needs to be a balance. We're not obviously asking for you know perfect roster to disband every conservation area and stick solar panels on everything and anything. Um, but there have been residents, and I think I'm going to actually it's easier if I just read the words of one of them. So um, a chap in in Blake Gary's have can, a, sorry, can we just stick that? We are, it, it probably answers the better question, the question better than I can. Um, I can paraphrase if that's if that's easier. Para, paraphrase quickly, thank you. Without without getting into the detail. So essentially, understanding that we can preserve the really important infrastructure or architecture um, in Perth and Kinross, whilst also allowing residents who who want to do the right thing to do that. So not necessarily everything within the conservation areas as they're originally set out would be in it subject to a review, but that, that's why we're asking for, for regular reviews rather than just getting rid of them all. We're not going to be, hopefully, I'm just sticking solar panels on, on anything and everything. Thank you. Councillor Cuthbert, you have three three points of clarification. Thank you, Convener. I've actually got four now. I thought of another one. Um, the first question is, <laughs> would, would you like them all at once or one at a time? If they're not related one at a time, and we'll let officers. OK, yeah. the first question is fairly simple. It's how many conservation areas do we have? 2022, I believe, but uh, officers, uh, David, can you confirm that? That, that? That's correct. OK, the next one's also simple. Uh, what capacity does the council have to do these conservation areas? We're going through a budget that's very, very tight, so it's a question of are we going to have to allocate more resources or do we have the resources in place? I'll, I'll pass that to uh, Barbara Renton. Thank you, convener. Um, as that has been discussed in other committees, you know, sort of our um, planning team have ebbed and flowed in terms of resources. Um, the point of or part of the point of the increase in charges was uh, to allow a widening of the pool of money that we had available, but at the moment we do not have sufficient resources to be able to take forward a regular review, and that's why we've not been able to do it. David might want to add in something else. No, I, th I think that covers it. There's no legal requirement to review conservation areas because the principal purpose and objective is to focus the effort on enhancing conservation areas. But we do recognise that it has been some time um, since we've just reviewed the policies to support heritage and conservation. And that wants to align with both National Planning Framework 4's objectives around climate change um, and also the, the imminent shortage, uh, Scottish Government consultation on widening permitted development rights. So that the time is right to begin that review. But as, as Mrs Renton has said, um, there is absolutely a, a, a resource implication of, of doing this. It, it's not um, a short process. It involves a combination of development management expertise, heritage expertise and, and place uh, development expertise. So um, it, it, it's not a it's not a short term process and to review them all uh, would, would take um, se several uh, years. Yeah, I think if we can just stick to the, the building energy, energy and the climate change stuff. Uh, Councillor Cuthbert, you still have one more point of clarification. It was just following on the response from David there. Did he say that the Scottish Government is already looking at something? Could you, could yes. you tell him? So it was just the second part of the motion that's asking us to write this. So could you give some clarity on why we're right there? This this is a point of clarification from Councillor Kugali and uh, Councillor Forbes. You're looking for uh, Councillor Kugali. So yeah, when, when I was having this conversation with officers originally, um, I, I was made aware that the Scottish Government are hopefully um, going to be looking to you know re review what is allowed or permitted development. I think is the correct terminology. Possibly corrected corrected on that, but it is important. I think at the same time that we, as a council and as this committee, being you know hopefully a fa fairly seismic one, can make it very clear to them what we hope the outcome of that will be in terms of their long term policy. So just because they're you know undertaking a review doesn't mean that 
you know, speaking out about it is entirely pointless. And I hope that obviously um, Councillor Waters will be will be on board with that um, and making clear to the Scottish Government that we hope there'll be progress on this. I'm going to let Councillor Cuthbert come in first, and then I may follow up on a question myself if it's not asked. Please do you go want ahead. My, my last two questions, or do you want me to? Yes. Okay. Please. Um, I understand there's there's something called cars schemes, which can produce um, provide external funding. I'm wondering if we've applied for any, and whether we can. Uh, there is other sources of funding that might actually pay for this, so that we get maybe an external person to do this, someone like Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, for example. Uh, D David, do you want to take that question, please? Uh, yes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of principal objective of designating conservation areas is not to preserve them as is, it's to, it's to enhance them. And, and the current consultation the government announced last week that is about to commence um, will look at what's appropriately extended by way of permitted development and what might not be. But the overlying objective still remains to enhance conservation areas, and that's done through a combination of internal and external resources. So uh, we do make extensive use of the CAR scheme, the conservation area regeneration schemes. Um, some of the buildings in Perth High Street um, have been redeveloped uh, using those funds. We've also had the Town Centre Fund, the Place Based Investment Fund. So in, in some respects, we have more opportunity at the moment uh, to look at enhancing our built heritage than we have had for a, a, a number of years. The, the second part of Councillor Cuthbert's question was about externalising that, that, that support. We, we do use external expertise as and when uh, appropriate, but fundamentally um, th there are two elements of, of conservation area review. One is about the physical survey, um, and, and that's something which could be uh, used in the past. We've done it using uh, uh, you know, planning graduates and also the Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. The second part actually is about planning policy and the, the regulations that support uh, planning decisions for the Planning Place Making Committee. And that is something that does need to be um, undertaken by, by officers as part of our regular review of, of, of planning policy. So as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's not a simple process but there is a combination of using external expertise and our own uh, resources as and when they are available uh, to, to undertake this this work. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Councillor McEwen come in f first with his point of clarification and I'll come back to you Councillor Cuthbert after. Uh, thank you Convener. Now the motion asks us to write to the appropriate minister um, but I know that the Parliament has a Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee that's chaired by Patrick Harvey. Is that who we're going to be proposed to be uh, writing to for support on this? I don't believe so, but I'll just look, look for some clarification of um, uh, David Littlejohn with that. Or the clarification. Or, or, or Councillor Kugali, who, 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 who I might write into. Who, sorry, if, 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 if if this committee deepens it, who am I writing? Who am I writing to? I must admit, I'm not entirely sure exactly who it would be. Um, so I hope that I hope that the work with that can be done, you know, behind the scenes to actually work out exactly who it is. I think the remit on this could be fairly grey. Um, the Patrick Harvey one is is a good point. Um, but I'm yeah again, which is why I left it open ended on purpose rather than putting a name in and then and then getting corrected in here. If, 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 if Council will allow me, this probably brings me into a question I would quite quite like to ask. Um, uh, David Littlejohn, you mentioned you mentioned that the Scottish Government are already doing doing a review on that. Uh, as as a council, do we do we have a, an ability to to um, participate or reply to within that review process um, from the building and energy perspective? Thank you. I sense we're straying into matters of, of, of planning policy um, and it would be the planning minister that has responsibility for um, implementing any changes uh, to conservation uh, area uh, permitted development rights. Um, so that's to Tom Arthur as the, as, as the planning minister. Um, the second part of your question, sorry convener. 
the, the, does, you, you mentioned in one of your responses that there is already a review going on to the permitted development yes. uh, uh, rights and, and does the council uh, have to, do we respond, do we get an input into that review as a council? Yes, it's, it's, again, we're, we're kind of delving into kind of, kind, of, kind of planning policy matters, but there's an ongoing review of permitted development rights um, phase one and phase two that have been uh, are now the, the, the regulatory change is laid before Parliament. Um, phase three was announced last week and phase three is looking at widening uh, permitted development rights to accommodate a wider range of energy efficiency measures um, across all areas. So, so that would include conservation areas, but uh, exclude listed buildings. That's, separate piece of legislation, but that that that, that consultation was announced uh, last week and will commence in the spring. And, and yes, as a, as a full public consultation that the council um, absolutely would be in a position to um, make a response. And it would, perhaps that's a matter for the EI and ED committee to consider uh, the, the, the policy response to that consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dave Cuthbert, you have one more point of clarification. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually very strongly in favour of conservation areas being updated because the the one that covers Kinross is out of date. We've had the, the, the schools being demolished at the back. The uh, county building has been repurposed. There's a, 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 a former building that was a uh, a petrol station that's gone so that the 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 stuff that's contained in the conservation area currently is out of date and inaccurate um, i'm just wondering are we planning to to actually look at these in terms of um, updating them hey. both for conservation Hi. and for climate change yeah i did the climate change in the end there but i think it's more an, an ei and ed one and 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 this is the complication with this is is what what part of this motion sits within within the remit of what what, what committees? Um, uh, if if okay, we'll just take that as a comment. <laughs> um, Councillor Kugali, do you have a point of clarification? And can I just ask? Can I just ask? Did the mover of the motion allow to have a point of clarification <laughs> from my legal? Thank you, thank you. Uh, Councillor Grant Lane, you have a comment. Uh, well, it's a suggestion maybe to the mover and the sender of the motion that in the second part of the motion we actually write to the Scottish Government to thank them for bringing forward the consultation period that will contain everything, you know, contain the, uh, what is asked for and that we will be a consultee in that rather than asking them to do something they're already done and if we're writing it to the committee, it will save you writing. If you can pass the letter to uh, Councillor Kogali, who can give it to our list MSP who sits on the committee. Thanks. Councillor Kogali. I, I think my re response would be, I think it, when eventually this does get finished, then I think it would be appropriate to thank them. Um, but until there's actual changes made, it'd be a bit weird to thank them prematurely. Surely you can't do a review presupposing the outcome. That would be absolutely ridiculous. If there's a review coming forward, you're saying you will thank them on the outcome, not on the review. Aye, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we're better. Councillor, is there any more points of clarification or any more comments? Councillor Tom McCune, you have an amendment. Yeah, I'm. I'm I agree with what the, the, mo the motion movers have brought to us today, that these processes and systems do need reviewed and they do need improved and the climate agenda action does need to be take more priority within the planning system than it currently does. And I think as councillors, we all accept that. But obviously the pressure to make these changes happen, although we'll be a commentary as a council, will also happen in the Holyrood Chamber. And I, I'm wondering whether the, the movers would like to add to their motion that, as well as writing to the minister, that we copy this letter to our own MSPs, both constituency and list MSPs, to basically 
push these for these changes on our behalf as Perth and Kinross, because surely that's their role in the Scottish Parliament. Simple as that. I assume that you were asking you were asking Councillor Kugali if they would add that to the to the to the Yeah, no, I'd be delighted to include that. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, I, I I'm 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 happy to 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 write and and my role as convener of the Climate Change and Sustainability Committee. Uh, absolutely. You know, the the on the second part and the right in the letter, um the there is there is already a review going on and and adding support to that to that review and 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 asking that is done as expediently and as as possible to 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 allow people to or to make sure that the balance is right and again that comes down to EI and ED committee um but certainly from a climate perspective to 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 encourage that I'm more than happy doing doing that so if there's no more comments or anything. I thought I thought he had you had a, you had agreed to council. Oh, sorry, Councillor Forbes, are you happy to second uh, uh, what Tom McEwen? You're right, uh, asked I, I had me. noted my agreement, but I, I suspect that uh, for the record, I have to say I agree and I'm happy to agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, I don't. I, 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 there's no. We're not going to a vote or or anything. If if I'm right, and and please keep me right here. I don't need to. There's no summing up if there's no vote or anything. So, given that you've accepted the amendment, uh, we've just that's the motion moved. Um, and 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 accepted with the additional amendment. Yes. Thank you. The outstanding business statement is the next item. Uh, can I ask if there are any questions on the outstanding business statement? Councillor Kugali? Uh, yes, and I, I hope um, Barbara is now prepared for this one after flagging it yesterday. Um, but a few meetings ago, there was an agreement that officers were going to have a look at the um, viability of passing um, electric car chargers over to the uh, potentially private business. And I was just wondering where we were on that. Barbara. The transport and development team through the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Fund and ongoing work with Scottish Futures Trust are currently looking at ways to work in partnership, not necessarily transferring the, uh, the ownership of the assets at the moment with the private sector to ensure that public electric vehicle charging uh, network grows and develops to support the increased demand across the whole of the council area, um, not just the high utilisation sites. The commercial charge point operator um, may or may not want to invest or operate these charge points in rural areas and I think that that's always going to be an issue because of the uh, demographic and the geography of, of the council area. Um, but we also already benefit from significant private sector investment in EV charging um, through the Tesla involvement at, at Broxden, etc. as well. The final operational model will be dependent on a number of factors, but a key aspect of the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Fund is to mobilise private sector capital to either fund all the required works and services or to be used alongside public sector capital to enable investment in an expanded public charge point network where commercial activity on its own would not be viable. Examples of this could include local authority site leasing and concession contracts. So very much a work in progress. Thank you. Can I ask councillors to note the outstanding business statement and to agree to remove any actions that are now complete? Can I just pass over to Councillor Liz Barrett um, for the next item on the agenda? Thank you, Convener. Um, I now invite Kirsty Stephen, the Principal Officer, to deliver a presentation on air quality. Thank you.
You're on mute, Kirsty. It's me, sorry. Um, yeah, there's been a change of plan. Um, I'm delivering the presentation instead. Sorry, I, I, I invite Oliver Law to deliver the presentation <laughs> on air quality in Perth and Kinross. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm Oliver Law. I'm the air quality technician at Environmental Health, um, and I deal with all things uh, air quality at the Council. Um, I'd just like to give you a quick overview today of our res responsibilities as a Council uh, regarding air quality and how we monitor it, how we try to improve it, and what's coming in the future year um, for us. Um, and I'd happily take any questions at the end of my presentation. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so we as a council have a legal responsibility to keep pollutants uh, which are harmful to human health at or below the minimum levels required by the government. Um, and in PKC's case, these pollutants of concern are nitrogen dioxide and particulate matters, PM10 and PM2.5. Um, to make sure that we meet these government standards, uh, we need to constantly monitor the air quality across Perth and Kinross. Um, and this also helps us assess the effectiveness of measures that we put in place to improve air quality. Um, and these measures target various emission sources, um, but the main focus is on reducing uh, traffic emissions wherever possible, um, as this is where the majority of uh, air pollutants come from. Um, and this can be through encouraging move to active travel um, discouraging engine idling, helping the adoption of EVs, um, etc. Uh, next slide, please. And um, before I go any further, uh, as this is a climate change committee, I feel like I should set out the crossovers between air quality and climate change um, as they're closely linked, but they're not the same thing. Um, so air quality is a, a concern mainly, mainly due to health impacts uh, that pollutants have on the local public, whereas climate change is an issue of global importance and has much uh, wider reaching consequences. Um, and the pollutants of concern for air quality, as I say, are nitrogen dioxide from car engines and particulates from diesel exhausts, uh, brake dust and uh, rubber from uh, tyres. Whereas climate change is more focused on greenhouse gases, um, so your CO2s, methane, uh, CFCs, etc. Next slide, please. Um, so while air quality and climate change are different, um, the improvement measures for both tend to be very similar, um, both focusing on reducing traffic emissions, for example, um, because vehicles are responsible for the majority of NO2 and particulate emissions, while also being the main source of um, CO2 in the UK. Um, so therefore, we work closely with our climate change colleagues to make sure that both of our projects um, have the maximum benefit for both air quality and climate change. Um, unfortunately, there are a few areas of conflicts between uh, air quality and climate change, such as the use of biomass and biofuels. Um, but to address this, uh, air quality has a permanent place on the Climate Change Transport Working Group, and we're consulted um, on all projects to ensure that air quality is a consideration. Next slide, please. Um, so back to air quality, um, how do we assess the pollution levels in Perth and Kinross? Um, so we use two types of monitoring. Um, on the left there is a real-time monitor, um, and these measure all three of the pollutants of concern 24-7. Um, the data is publicly accessible on the Scottish Government's website. Um, however, they're expensive and bulky, um, so we can only place them in our worst hotspots. Um, so we've got four at the moment in Perth and Kinross. Um, and to supplement these, we use uh, diffusion tubes on the right. These only measure nitrogen dioxide, um, but they're significantly cheaper and easier to deploy um, as we can mount them to lamp posts and drain pipes uh, throughout Perth and Kinross. Um, though they're less accurate than the real time monitors, they give us a good indication of hotspots and can be easily moved um, to give us a, an idea of overall air quality throughout Perth and Kinross. And it's uh, something we constantly review. Um, to fill in the gaps between these two monitoring types, we use uh, air quality modelling. The next slide, please. Um, so this is an image of our most recent uh, modelling of Perth City's nitrogen dioxide levels. Um, so the red and yellow colours are higher levels and the green low levels. Um, and the blue dots are our diffusion tubes spread out across the city centre. Um, so this modelling takes into account years of monitoring data, um, traffic trends, wind movements, building heights etc and provides us a, an accurate estimate of air pollution con concentrations in the area even if that area is not directly uh, monitored. Next slide please. 
Um, the modeling also takes into account the fleet composition of an area and estimates uh, which vehicle types are contributing most in any given location. Um, so for example, uh, buses are the main contributor at the uh, Mill Street bus stops, uh, while on Dundee Road, there's a larger proportion of uh, pollutants from HGVs. Next slide, please. Um, so what do we know from our data? Um, air quality in general is good throughout Perth and Kinross, um, the exception being our hotspots in our two air quality management areas in Creef High Street and uh, Perth City, and that's the image on the left there, that's the air quality management area. Um, PKC were required to declare these AQMAs in 2005 for Perth and 2016 for Creef, uh, following a number of recorded exceedances of the national objectives. Um, and following the declaration of an AQMA, um, an air quality action plan is required to set out how we would reduce air pollution in these areas. And uh, Perth's air quality action plan is currently being updated. And I'll touch on this later. Um, so things have been going well for, it, for us uh, with no breaches of objective levels in Perth and Kinross in the last five years. Um, on the right in that graph, you'll see that NO2 levels, the red line, um, have been steadily falling at Athol Street since 2017. Um, PM 2.5s have remained sort of steady. And although it looks like the um, blue line, the PM 10s there are rising in the last couple of years, this is actually due to uh, building works going on directly behind the Athol Street monitor. And um, these levels are expected to subside once those works are done. Um, and that said, we can't be complacent. Um, the Scottish Government's Cleaner Air for Scotland 2 strategy states that while uh, compliance with an obje the objectives is a minimum requirement, um, wherever practical and feasible, we should continue to reduce uh, preventable air pollution beyond these limits. Um, and in addition, um, our colleagues in, in traffic and uh, network are saying that the levels in Perth are now consistently above uh, pre-COVID levels, um, with the rush hour peaks now spread out throughout the day rather than your sort of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, peaks. So we don't yet know what impact this is going to have on air pollution in the long term. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the previous graph was for Perth, um, but it's a similar story for Creef. Uh, we've had no exceedances since 2018 and the levels are falling consistently. And as a result, in response to our annual progress report in 2022, uh, Scottish Government have recommended that we move to revoke this air quality management area. Um, now, revocation is only an option after three consecutive years of compliance with the national guidelines and should only be carried out following a, a detailed study to make sure that no future exceedances will occur within that air quality management area. Um, so we'll therefore be starting this revocation process this year, um, a process which involves sort of further modeling um, and scenario testing, which can take up to uh, 18 months to complete. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of air pollutants in our area are from traffic emissions and as such, the most significant air quality improvement measures relate to transport. Um, so though we are the air quality lead at the council, um, environmental health alone don't have the scale of funding to carry out uh, large infrastructure works like the Cross Tay Link Road, even though they would make um, the biggest impact on air quality in our uh, hotspot areas. So we therefore work closely with the teams that do have the knowledge and resource um, for larger projects to ensure that the air quality benefits are maximised. Um, and all of these listed uh, long term projects are part of our objectives um, within our action plans. And as such, we regularly get updates from them um, to include within our, our annual progress reports, which are submitted to the Scottish Government each year. Um, that said, environmental health do carry out a number of our own smaller projects uh, using Scottish Government air quality grant funding. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we regularly commission a detailed air quality modelling across the region, um, including a full Perth and Kinross wide uh, model a number of years ago. Um, we support the rollout of the EV chargers and have helped install uh, chargers in all the public car parks within the Creef air quality management area. Um, we help with the installation of cycle parking, bus shelters, um, passenger information boards, um, as well as cycle proficiency training through the iBike officer, um, all to encourage the move to sustainable transport to reduce uh, traffic emissions. Um, to raise awareness on air quality, we take part in Clean Air Day every year, 
both through social media and uh, events we organize at schools. Um, and to reduce fleet emissions from private businesses, uh, PKC is one of a number of local authorities that take part in the EcoStars scheme. Um, so this scheme recruits members, um, assesses their fleet and provides a roadmap for how they should re uh, reduce their emissions and fuel usage. And um, so from a business point of view, they get free advice and guidance on saving fuel and upgrading to more efficient vehicles, uh, while PKC gets the benefits of reduced emissions. Um, so our main projects for this year are completing our new updated uh, Perth Air Quality Action Plan, uh, revoking the CREEF Air Quality Management Area and the introduction of anti-idling enforcement uh, in PKC. And I'll talk about anti-idling on the next slide. Um, so our Perth Action Plan was written in 2009 and as such is due a substantial review and update. Um, and we've, we've been working with other services over the last year to essentially rewrite this plan from scratch uh, with a brand new suite of improvement measures. Um, as Perth has our worst hotspots, it's important that we get this right. Um, so we're at the final draft stage um, with our steering group and will likely be going out to public consultation in the next couple of months. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll be starting the process for revoking Grief's air quality management area, though this, this can take up to 18 months. Next slide, please. So a big project for us this year is anti-idling enforcement, which will be coming into effect very shortly in uh, March 1st. And you may have seen some of the uh, comms go out for that already. Um, so we're having a minimum of four weeks comms uh, campaign across radio, press, social media, etc. Um, ahead of enforcement starting to make sure that all the motoring public are aware it's coming. Um, and it'll be parking attendants that will be carrying out this enforcement uh, with a focus on our two air quality management areas. Um, so officers will be following a four E's approach. So firstly, they'll engage with an offender and ask them to switch off their engine. Uh, they'll then explain the risks of idling emissions uh, to public health, air quality and climate change. Um, they will then encourage compliance with these regulations and again ask that the engine be switched off. Um, and only after these three steps uh, have been used will officers be forced to issue a fixed penalty notice as a last resort. Um, so we're not expecting to have to issue many of these, uh, but it is an option. And next slide, please. Yeah. Um, before I finish up, I'd like to just quickly cover uh, wood burning stoves, as this is something which uh, Councillor Barrett and I have had to deal with uh, recently. So with energy prices rising, uh, many have chosen to install stoves within their home as a cheaper energy uh, alternative. Um, but poor installation, uh, maintenance and operation of the stove can lead to high levels of particulates being emitted, uh, even from more modern stoves. Um, add to this the use of poor quality or damp fuel, and a stove can be a real uh, public health problem both to the neighbours and to the stove user themselves. Uh, so environmental health often receive complaints about smoke uh, from neighbouring fires and stoves, but unfortunately we don't have many powers to deal with this. Um, and it's a national issue that the Scottish Government are aware of, um, and they're working to update legislation for smoke control areas, which will give us um, hopefully more power over what is being burned uh, in Perth and Kinross. Um, but until then, our best route of option is uh, action is addressing the issues a stove may cause before it's installed uh, through the planning process. Um, so environmental health assess the planning list every week um, for any application of concern to noise and odour as well as air quality. Um, and in the case of stoves, um, planning permissions required for any flue which is installed within an air quality management area. Um, but even if we see a stove on an application out with an air quality management area, it's something we'll comment on. Um, and we aim to make sure that all new stoves have a flue which is high enough that they won't result in any smoke nuisance um, from nearby neighbours. Um, unfortunately, not all stoves require planning permission, so many slip through the net, um, but currently this is our best way of uh, mitigating the issue. Um, so in summary then, uh, we as a council have a duty to monitor the air quality on air, in our area um, and identify possible exceedances of national objective levels for PM10, 2.5 and nitrogen dioxide. Um, where an exceedance is detected, an air quality management area needs to be put in place. 
um, as we've done in uh, Perth and Creef, and an action plan also be created to try to bring down levels back below objectives. Uh, and while there's been no exceedances in Perth and Kinross in recent years, we can't be complacent. Um, what with the, the change in traffic trends post pandemic and their unknown long term effect on air quality, as well as uh, the Cleaner Air for Scotland 2 strategy saying that we should go as far as possible to reduce air pollution. We can't take our foot off the gas yet. Um, much of the projects and strategies which have the biggest impact on air quality are under the remits of services other than environmental health. Um, so we need to work together uh, with those other services to make sure that air quality remains a key consideration. Um, the large areas of work I'm focusing on this year are completing our updated action plan for Perth, introducing anti-idling enforcement and be beginning the process of revoking our air quality management area in Creef as per the government's uh, recommendation. And in between these projects, uh, environmental health continue to assess all planning applications uh, for air quality impacts, including those uh, of wood burning stoves to try and mitigate any future problems they may cause. Um, and just one final point about uh, the future. Um, environmental Standards Scotland, which was created in uh, 2021, have announced that their first investigation will be focusing on air quality and the effectiveness of uh, Scottish government's local air quality management uh, regime. So they've got a consultation out at the moment on new strengthened policy guidelines um, for LAQM, which will involve stricter timescales and targets for local authorities to adhere to. Um, and if we don't meet these deadlines, um, SEPA will be authorised to use their enforcement powers against us. Um, so as I say, this is in consultation just now, but if these new guidelines are approved, um, our workloads will likely increase in the near future. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Oliver? Uh, I think Angus and then Noah. <laughs> Thanks for that, Oliver. That was really interesting. I've got a couple of questions, but I'll I'll stick to the rules and go one at a time. And you talked about wood burning stoves. Mm -hmm. um, I think the issue you were explaining was that wood burning stoves that burn that are not installed properly are burned perhaps wet wood are the issue. It, does the same issue apply to stoves that are installed properly professionally and, and what's been burned is dry and seasoned and ready to go? Um, when installed properly and, and all the wood's dry and such, um, they actually produce very few emissions and um, because if it's burning efficiently all that really should be coming out the top is um, sort of CO2 and water um, there should be few particulates but if if it's being burned incorrectly if it's a poorly installed stove um, there'll be more smoke and as a result of this smoke it's more um, particulates coming out of the stove. Thank you. Uh, Noah? Yes, there we go. Um, questions on the um, fixed penalty notices for the idling. Um, kind of two questions in one, but not very hard. Firstly, the cost of the uh, FPNs, and then secondly, whether they are they have the fixed penalty notices. Are they just for the one instant that's treated in isolation at the time? So turn off your engine. No, here you go. That's fine. Um, or is it for repeat offenders over time? Um, and if it is the latter, um, how how would that be logged? Um, so the cost of the fixed penalty notice is a, a fixed fine of £20 um, and if it's not paid within a certain period of time that goes up to, to £40 and that's just that's a number which is set by the, the government as so we can't change that. Um, as to repeat offenders, um, I don't believe it's something which is a, a rising scale of costs um, but if it's say a larger provider like um, a, a bus company or, or taxi company um, it's something we can we can report to the higher ups if it becomes a, a problem um, of repeat offending and if the, the fixed penalty notices aren't aren't doing anything. I think Barbara would like to comment. Um, and as Oliver pointed out, it is a very slow process. We're really keen to do the education element, and that was what, what the approach that was agreed by the former E and I committee back in March last year when the anti idling policy was approved. OK, thank you. Um, sorry, I missed Jack was actually ahead of Dave on questions. So uh, Jack Welsh. 
Thank, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, a, a question. Um, the Scottish Government, through the Scottish Zero Emission Bus Challenge Fund, ScotZeb, uh, has essentially uh, put significant uh, investment into supporting Stagecoach to effectively introduce new electrified bus services in Perth and, and, and Inverness. Obviously, Perth is immediately uh, pertinent for us. In terms of projections of improvements to air quality, is, has there any work been done that, that can be shared um, um, with regards to these plans, please? Um, none specifically done by us, um, but I can always research that and get back to you. Yeah, it'd be useful to understand because obviously, you know, um, older buses in particular are a significant source of of, of emissions. And uh, while the while the bus fleet in in Perth and Kinross is 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 a reasonably new diesel fleet, I, I would expect um, electrification of that fleet will, should make a significant difference uh, to 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 emissions in the city. That's certainly something which we could um, we could model because, as I say, we've got the. Um, sort of fleet distribution as part of our air quality modelling that if we change those um, parameters such that there's more say electric buses going through um, Perth we can see that direct effect yeah thank you and I think obviously we would want to work directly with Stagecoach through the public transport unit as well to get that full information so thank you for the question thank you Councillor Cuthbert Thank you, Vice Convener, and thank you, Oliver. That's a very clear and concise presentation. It was good to hear. Um, I was it, intrigued by the trend lines that you showed in one of your slides, which seemed to indicate that there was about a 25% drop in terms of pollutants in the air. Um, presumably, that's because of the COVID effect and um, people now working from home. So with the introduction of more electric vehicles and the removal of petrol and diesel vehicles in seven years, Presumably that trend line is going to keep going down and we've talked about, so Jack Welsh brought up the question of the, the buses. Um, I'm just wondering, do you see that trend line continuing to fall to, to the point where it almost disappears? Um, I don't know if it would completely disappear, but certainly um, the improvements we've seen over regular um, years, most of that will be a result of people updating their vehicles to um, newer ones um, and tighter uh, engine restrictions sort of Euro 6 and such. Um, so yes, I do expect that trend line to gradually go down, but I, I don't think it would go to zero. Thank you, Oliver. Um, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that report. Uh, you mentioned increased pollution on the Dundee Road. It's growing um, in your report. I just wonder, I'm travelling at that door that road every day really and a lot increasing number of HEVs on that road coming in. I'm not quite sure why they're using that. Maybe the delays in Brock's Den to avoid and come through the city of Perth up to Brock's Den and was across the link road coming on shortly. Um, lorry drivers are, I understand, don't like the Kingsway and they're taking avoiding action and using Dundee Road through Perth Schoon and up to 94 um, is that the reason why the pollution's going up? What level has it increased on Dundee Road? Um, so I don't believe I, I said that pollution was rising on Dundee Road. Um, I did point out that there was a higher proportion um, of the pollution on that road coming from HGVs. Um, and as you say, it's likely that they're, they're wanting to avoid um, more congested roads. Um, and it is our hope that the, the cross tail link road will hopefully redirect um, traffic where possible. Um, and reduce um, the high levels of, of air pollution we have. Certainly, um, Bridge End is one of our sort of hotspots uh, in Perth. Um, and as such, we put in place um, one of our, our real time monitors is on Bridge End so that we have uh, sort of more accurate data um, at that location. But I wouldn't say that pollution is rising um, at that location. OK, and the second little point might be on idling. Um, most modern cars, is, is it switch on or switch off? I'm not quite sure. My car does stop when I'm at the lights and start up. Is that an automatic system on cars that idle? Do lorries have the same system to idle automatically when they're ticking over for a certain length of time? Or is that something we should be encouraging manufacturers to add to that option to vehicles? 
Over. Um, I'm not sure if if um, HGVs have have that option. Certainly, newer cars, it's it's um, it's sort of a standard issue now. Um, but it's not. It's certainly in my case, it's not the case that it turns on at all times. It's quite a finicky thing. Um, but yeah, that is certainly something which we'll see an improvement from. Um, the anti idling um, enforcement obviously won't be focusing on people parked at uh, traffic lights because that's a sort of justified stop and justified having your engine on. It's more if you're in a position where you're parked and you have no need for your, your engine to be on, that's where the enforcement's um, going to be uh, delivered. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Councillor Ling next, please. Thanks, uh, Vice Convener. I think on the last point, um, especially with the HGVs, we'd have to you'd, you'd have to look at the data of actually switching off and starting up again. As an HGV, I think that's when it would provide actually uh, or provoke more emissions and the restarting than it would if it was continually idling. But that's just uh, from a background that. Uh, and then when you accelerate to take away, obviously you you, you get more unburnt fuel. Um, Oliver, thanks for for the presentation. I appreciate it. I was, I, I was looking at and as we go to hydrogen powered HGVs, now I would like to see we'd all like to see this continue to to go down in the cross tail road. Like so, I think um, Perth is moving definitely in the right direction and improving air quality. And if we can take the pressure off Perth and we have got um, HGV vehicles as part of this committee, I think we'd like to see um, you working in tandem with others to maybe change the whole way that the traffic moves round about Perth um, if there's less per, uh, Perth and, and we green it up even more. But uh, also uh, just the way it circulates in Perth, if there's not so much traffic needing to come into town, um, do you see that as a way of even reducing uh, the, the, the or improving the air quality moving forward? Um, yes, yeah, certainly if, if much of the road traffic which goes through Perth, especially through Athol Street, Athol Street is our worst area. Um, if much of this traffic can be relocated elsewhere, um, yeah, we'll see a significant improvement. Um, so yeah, the cross tail link road we are expecting to see a noticeable improvement, uh, certainly at Athol Street, um, from much of the traffic going around Perth. Um, and any way we can encourage that, we'd certainly be trying to. Thank you. Um, I know. That was my fault. Trigger happy. Um, and obviously the mobility strategy, which will come forward in due course, will look at traffic movement, moving traffic out with the certainly the in inner ring road for, for Perth, but also about greening the city and much more use of active travel and, and bus transport. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I think, Jack, you have a comment? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Vice Convener. And again, I should have said, Oliver, this is a, a, a great re report and, uh, you know, it starts to give, you know, increased visibility as to where we need to sort of uh, go looking to, to improve air quality in, 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 in Perth and Canross. You, you talked about NOx emissions. This is this is really a, is a comment. Um, it's not generally recognised that uh, emissions from natural gas boilers, both commercial boilers and, and domestic boilers, is a significant contributor of NOx emissions. And I just wanted to highlight that uh, Home Energy Scotland are offering grants of up to uh, £9,000 and, and also energy efficiency grants of up to £9,000 to remove um, um, gas boilers and, and, and install um, um, electric heat pumps um, as part of uh, the heat and buildings strategy. And, and these these installations will meaningfully uh, benefit uh, NOx uh, reductions in, in urban environments too. Thank you. Um, and a question from Tom, Councillor McEwen. All of us actually answered any question I've thought of since reading these papers and this process of either this presentation or answering other people. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and I think the last question I've got showing up is Councillor Forbes, who has a question and a comment. 
Thanks. Um, Oliver, I'm delighted to see the change in, in particular in Creef. So I remember a few years ago, Creef was a, a really big problem area for us. So I'm really pleased to see that's coming down the way to the point that we can take that air quality management out. So delighted with that. Um, I wonder if I could ask you about low emission zones. So I've got a friend who's a small business in the centre of Dundee, genuinely terrified about the prospect of what that will do to to her business. Is there any danger we may end up with that in Perth or are we doing so well that that's just not on the radar at all? Uh, not currently. Um, in 2019, all councils as part of their annual progress report had to do um, a sort of assessment to determine whether um, a low emission zone would be beneficial um, in their, their air quality management area. And so we did this for both uh, Creef and Perth and the results of that uh, showed that it wasn't necessary. Uh, what we are already doing was expected to to get us down below um, national objectives, um, and it was, yeah, it wasn't necessary. And only if there's a significant change um, in what we're recording for air uh, air pollution would we need to revisit this. Um, so I'd say there's no no requirement for them, and um, there has been talk in the past of people thinking it'd be a good thing to put in voluntarily, um, but currently we've got no plans for it. And did you have a comment as well, Angus, or was that it all rolled into one? No, just uh, I just wanted to thank you, um, Oliver, for that presentation. Um, it was really concise, clear, and uh, you answered our questions very well, and uh, even I understand them. So thanks very much for doing that. And uh, interest particularly on the, the discussion we had about wood burning stoves, and I don't know if I should declare an interest here that I have two wood burning stoves installed properly and in burning only dry wood, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, joking aside, that's another area where I think we'll we'll come into conflict as people, because of the cost of living crisis, decide to install stoves or open fires and, and burn wood rather than turn their heating on. Uh, that's an area of conflict I suspect we'll be talking about for some time to come. But thanks very much for your presentation. Um, if there aren't any more questions or comments, I would like to uh, re reiterate the thanks from Angus um, to Oliver for a very clear and helpful presentation, um, which I think we've all found extremely useful. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Councillor Ling, Ling would like to comment. So, sorry, uh, Vice Convener, it took a little while to travel the distance. I could have walked over and handed you a note quicker than it got sent by the, the machine. So, um, yeah, I agree with Councillor Fors, but I'm sure he will know if he's burning season wood. It's not that much of a cheaper option these days, getting a uh, good dry... Well, I don't want to know, don't want to know. Um, so that's where all these pre-protection orders have been disappearing. Um, <laughs> but it's not... <laughs> but it's not a cheap. Uh, it is not a cheap option if you're if you're burning. And I think exactly has the point he made. People are looking for cheaper things, pallets, etc., to burn, which you can easily get. But they're impregnated with various chemicals, so it is a, it is a serious point. And also the point I agree with Councillor Forbes is that until we tackle the ridiculous cost of energy and heating, and that associated with <laughs> in my view, ridiculous profits of uh, the companies providing energy and heating, we will not change this because people can't have, it's the only way that they've got to actually keep themselves warm. And it's just a consequence of, uh, uh, it'll have to be done sympathetically, the, the way that we, you know, we treat people and, and what they're burning. Thanks. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll now pass back over to the convener. Thank you, Vice Convener. We go to item seven on the paper now, Sus Sustainable Development Performance Report. Uh, can I ask Angela Harris, the Sustainable Development Officer, to introduce the report? Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, everyone. The Council's duties regarding sustainable development are set out under the best value duty of the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003. The best value duty requires that the Council, while discharging its own functions, must act in a way which contributes to the achievement of sustainable development. Best value guidance was first published in 2004 with one of the seven themes being focused on sustainable development. 
Revised guidance was published in 2020, and this report provides an update of the Council's progress and performance towards delivering sustainable development in line with the 2020 guidance. The report seeks approval of committee on this updated performance position as set out in Appendix 1 and the proposals for areas of focus for 2023-24 set out in the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, do members have any questions on the report? If there's no questions, I will I will move the report. Uh, Councillor Forbes, you would like to come in with a comment. If it's appropriate at the moment, move I'm happy right. to let you move first. Move, and it, then first. Come in. move it first, right? I've got, I that, just, I've got I that mixed up last time as well. I think. So Ling's uh, message to get across the room, I thought I'd better get in early. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just, just a, a, a thank you to, to Angela Harris and the, the team for this for this paper and the work that's went into to the the report. This is exceptionally report important, and um, that we get this right, um, and and it influences the whole the whole way we deliver sustainability throughout the council. The council plays a key role in delivering sustainable development through best value to promote environmental social and economic well-being for both residents and visitors across Perth and Kinross. This report provides a review of the Council's corporate sustainable development performance in line with be revised best value guidance, as well as detailing areas of upcoming focus for the coming year. We are asked to approve the report and areas of focus. The Council is making steady progress in delivering sustainable development in compliance with best value guidance. There is a clear commitment to following an integrated approach to sustainable development as reflected in our strategic priorities and decision making arrangements. Enhanced through the establishment of the Council's Climate Change and Sustainability Committee, partnership working with focus on the Perth and Kinross offer continues to be effective in delivering public services that deliver sustainable development. Work is underway to develop systems to integrate sustainable development into our decision making processes, ensuring our resources are managed sustainably. The proposed area of focus for the coming year seeks to further improve the Council's sustainable development compliance with best value duty. I am pleased to move the paper for your approval. Council, Council <laughs> Vice Convener, <laughs> would you like to second that? Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd also like to thank Angela for a very clear and comprehensive report, um, and I am happy to second it. Thank you. Do, 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 do members have any comments on the report? And I'll go straight away to Councillor Forbes at, the, at this point. <laughs> Thanks. I was simply going to comment that it is a really good report and it's incredibly well written. And I always feel bad for officers who've put a lot of effort into something and then no one asks any questions. But actually, I see that as a positive thing because it's written so well and so clearly that even me in my first uh, visit to this committee, I understand it um, and got the gist of everything that that was in it um, very easily. So um, thanks to the officers for putting so much effort into it. Agreed. <laughs> Switching between screens, I'm not the fastest at it. <laughs> and that's even with two screens. Uh, Councillor Kugali. I think Councillor Forbes has summed up my sentiment pretty well there. Um, I'd also just like to, you know, raise specific I don't know, praise um, on the IVA um, tool because that that seems like a really meaningful step in making sure that we're doing things 
that actually matter and actually have an impact. And that's the priority, not just the image, um, which I know is a frustration for a lot of people up and down the country and probably across most of the world, especially when it comes to stuff like sustainable development, that there's too much of a focus on image. Um, but this seems like a serious step to make sure that we focus on substance. Um, and that is you know, fantastic from the officers, but again, also terrifically written. Thank you. Councillor Ling. Oh. Thank you. It gives me great joy to be have to be able to say that um, Councillor Forbes has said more eloquently and, and fulsomely exactly what I was wanting to say and backed up by Councillor Noah Gali. I think um, it's actually, it doesn't show disinterest in the report, as has already been said, it shows that the report has been well written. Um, the, the, the point that uh, strikes me is under figure one, where it says that um, it, it's not a goal here. We'll never achieve the, the final end point of scoring the goal and everything's in, interconnected, but we can only continue to work to uh, have sustainable de development and that will morph as we move forward. And uh, uh, as a starting off report, we can keep monitoring again. So it's good to see the red, amber and green, but they've just made that up on the hoof because uh, everything else has been already said by the, the previous speakers. Thanks. Thank you. If there's no more comments, and if there's no amendments to that, can, uh, can we agree the recommendations in the report? And that brings us to the end of uh, the business for today. I hope everybody has an enjoyable uh, remainder of the morning and afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>